just a reminder, all of these videos, uh, presentations are being videoed today, and they'll be on the uh, Central Electronics website. It's um, www.ce-multiphase.com. And you'll also be able to see some of the uh, videos from past uh, symposiums as well. There's a lot of information at the site. But I'd like to introduce Rob Sherwood, um, <coughs> NC0B. As you know, Rob uh, does a whole lot of, has been doing this for many years, testing of, of uh, HF radios, transceivers, and contesting, and, and certainly uh, he'll provide us a bunch of information about what radios are doing today, how well they're performing, and what we ought to be looking for in the future. All right, Nick, thanks. Yeah, I did start testing radios about 1975 or 76, so it kind of goes back. So I'm going to talk about receivers, but also transmitters. So um, I think question there right just a moment ago about uh, what's, where is the transmit side of things. So let's get to some basics down. Uh, what is sensitivity and noise floor? Well, you know, the sensitivity was defined a long time ago, 10 dB signal plus noise to noise ratio, and um, in a sideband bandwidth. And by the way, if you've got a question, it's kind of hard to remember something from, you know, 30 minutes ago. So just if you have a question or need something explained in a little more detail, just get my attention. Um, and I'm going to quote the sensitivity on my website in microvolts, yes. not dBm, because really from a historical standpoint, if, let's say you have a Drake 2B or something. I know Bob has it. Bob Heil has a 2B. Uh, you can look up the spec and say, all right, how's that compared to today? So that's on my website. And then noise floor came along much later, 1975, and that's a, a 3 dB signal plus noise to noise floor in a given bandwidth. You need to define the bandwidth, but we've mostly published data in a 500 hertz bandwidth. Then dynamic range. Well, what's it mean? Well, this QST and Ham Radio Magazine, I wish we had Ham Radio Magazine still around. How many used to read that? Yes. <laughs> so may, someone needs to invent Ham Radio Magazine dash two. Um, they defined the new things that dynamic range noise floor. That wasn't something we knew about back in uh, that time period. And so what you did was feed in two signals, and when the, the third order distortion product, which is dominant, and if we're doing a test like that, when that distortion product equals the noise floor, then th the difference between those two levels, the noise floor and the signal, that's the dynamic range. So here's an example for the magic 100 dB radio that we always wanted. If it took a pair of uh, signals that were minus 28 dBm and the noise floor was minus 128, the difference is 100 dB. And that's, you know, we kind of all like, well, wish we had, or had 100 dB radio, but guess what? We don't really need it most of the time. So luckily, a lot of radios work just fine if you're not, don't happen to own your 100 dB radio. So here's what the state of the art today is, and not just like one radio. We've got several radios that are 100 dB or better. Reciprocal mixing dynamic range. That's a term that the league invented recently in about 2012 or something that talked about phase noise. And phase noise wasn't an issue if we had our Collins or our Drake or our multiphase or whatever because they were just local oscillators, LC, or maybe they had band crystals, of course, to get on the other band. So everything was pretty clean. We didn't have the enormous dynamic range numbers, but phase noise wasn't a problem. And of course, we then got synthesized radios. They don't drift anymore, but the early synthesizers were terrible from the standpoint of noise. So almost everything that I tested back when the synthesized radios became popular the close-in dynamic range, in other words, the 2KC dynamic range versus the 20 or even wider, the phase noise was the limit. So that kind of got lost in the shuffle for a while. And then, um, but then the league finally determined to define this term reciprocal mixing dynamic range, and they do emphasize that today. So that's really good. So if we look at radios that just take an arbitrary number that 96 dB or better, all those radios are that good today. And this is astounding. I mean, all six major manufacturers have uh, radios that are just tremendous uh, on some of these basic specs. So what are the latest rigs? Well, of course, we had 
the TS-890S was shown at Dayton, and then it came out about the, the, uh, by the September. And it's a hybrid architecture, which I'll explain. And it actually has the highest reciprocal mixing diamond range I've ever measured by a few dB. And then the uh, FTDX 101D came out a, a year later. And um, it's also a hybrid, meaning it's kind of a, like a K3, but then with the bottom, the latter portion, the radio is all direct sampling, that type of stuff, or at least it's digital. So unfortunately, the Yezu came out after the uh, contest season was over between you know, 2018 and 2019. So I never got to use it in a contest, which I'm sorry to say, I haven't even gotten another loaner since then. So I haven't got to use that. I can't talk about that from a contesting standpoint. So let's look at the two new two Kenwoods, the new Kenwood and the one that came out about six years ago, the 990. And the 990 had really big numbers wide spaced. And that's back when those uh, dynamic range was defined. All they tested was at 20 kilohertz, which was fine for a radio designed in the 50s and 60s. And But then once these up conversion radios came along, that measurement really didn't mean much. But um, as we see with the TS-990 compared to the 890, which is the new kit on the block, let's look at just that 2KC reciprocal mixing dynamic range number difference, 89 versus 127. And actually, the league for, for about 2008 to 2012 or 13, they, I guess they got tired of hearing the radio is phase noise limited, so they say, let's make the measurement with a one hertz filter to filter out the phase noise, and we're going to tell you what the dynamic range is, even though how many here use a one hertz filter on the air? <laughs> so far, no one's ever raised their hand. And unfortunately, that kind of made the, the phase noise performance be forgotten, and actually that's what happened with the TS-990. Kenwood kind of didn't realize that the test was being measured in such a way that their 990 looked great, but in reality we don't use a 1 hertz filter or a 3 hertz filter, so they kind of missed the boat. And actually I got to talk to the designer at Dayton a few years ago, and he says, I don't understand. You're on your website it says this, and the league says that, and they're not the same. And finally, of course, my Japanese is really bad. And his English was better than my Japanese. It took about 20 minutes, and he finally said, the light bulb moment. So then, of course, the 890 came along, and they, like, nailed it. So the testing now, if you look in the QST, anything from about 2013 on, they've got reciprocal mixing dynamic range clearly defined. You know, it's in those color little graphs and things like that. So we don't have that problem anymore. Between 2008 and 2012, we really didn't, we had kind of an anomaly there. So let's look and compare the 101D to the 890S. Well, in, in the dynamic range numbers, the Yezu's a little bit above, and then the reciprocal mixing numbers, the, Ken was a little bit above. Are we really going to worry about that? I mean, these radios are phenomenal from those basic number standpoint. So you, you shouldn't pick a radio and say, okay, that one's a 110 and the other's 106. Like, they're kind of getting in the minutia, into the weeds. These, the numbers are just tremendous today. And you're going to look at everything else that's important, it's, uh, features and reliability and all that kind of stuff. So let's compare um, really using on the air, not in the laboratory. And so actually starting back in 2018, I was like, I'm going to use these radios in the same contest. I have multiple operating positions. I don't do multi-multi contesting, but I change chairs to change bands. So it makes it really easy to have two radios or even three set up. And they just you know, operate one for an hour, change you know, the other one. So what's a good test? Um, AWRL-160CW to me is a good test for QRM. AWRL-10 meters is a good test for weak signals. And really both of these radios, the 7610 and the uh, 890S were good examples of DSP is good, the audio peak filter for UCW operators as it really works well. And the ergonomics are different, but quite good. You don't have to go into menus all the time to do something like turn up the volume or something crazy like that. It happens to be at my QTH. I'm out in the country. You'll see a picture right at the end. 
Um, I don't have a lot of noise, but occasionally on 160, I get a little bit of line noise during the day, and it goes off at night. Who knows why? But the noise reduction and the noise blanking happens to work better with the noise I've got on the uh, ICOM compared to the uh, Kenwood. But then on the other hand, why do I own the Kenwood? The waterfall and the display, the spectrum scope are just phenomenal for the way I operate as a search and pounce CW operator in a contest. Now, I'm not good enough to run, but I certainly have fun uh, just picking you know, one station at a time and just work my way up the band. So here's the reason I don't like the display as much on my ICOM. If you tune the radio, now I like a really narrow span when we're talking about dozens of signals in a few kilohertz. And uh, I just as soon have tuned the radio and keep the center as where I'm tuned. But when you tune the uh, most radios today with the waterfall, it smears. You, you know, so you tune it here like it just did, and there's a big you know, diagonal line. And that sort of makes it less useful to me, the way I happen to operate. But there's other ways, of course, to set up your display and do things. And also, if you look there on the right where it says note, there's a little weak signal. And if I had, if I had averaging on so that I can kind of average out the noise, make the noise a little bit lower on the display, if I tuned the radio, not only did it slew, but I couldn't see that really weak signal for two or three seconds because the averaging had to kind of build it up. So I just operate the uh, 7610 with the averaging off, and I just mostly look at the spectrum display as opposed to the waterfall. That's just how I do it. Mm -hmm. Now here's the way the 890 works. And in comparison, when you tune it, the w waterfall just shifts. So if you tune down, you get a little dead spot there for 30 seconds until it totally fills in. Of course, after five seconds, it's showing what's going on right now. So that really worked for me in that I could uh, uh, utilize the waterfall better. And the other thing is kind of amazing is um, when you tune it, whatever DSP bandwidth is selected is highlighted right in the middle. And when you quit tuning, that goes away in a couple seconds. But I can just tune in the next station centered in the waterfall on that highlighted area and boom, working. It's almost like I say, shooting fish in a barrel. This is a display in the December second weekend of 2018 on 10 meters. And um, we've got more than 20 signals in considering the conditions on 10 meters these days. We had 20 signals or more in a 10 kC bandwidth. And uh, this is with the Kenwood. Now note, over on the right, I've got the preamp on. Because was, Bob was talking about attenuation, preamp, this is really important stuff. We don't want to be running the preamp when it's inappropriate, and we probably wouldn't be running the attenuator on 10 meters. So I had the preamp on, no big surprise there. Now here's the uh, this 7610 on 160. We've got over 30 stations in a 10 kC bandwidth. And since I'm doing the S&P, I'll just start at 1800 and work my up, way up to 1860. Maybe it might take me two hours to do that and work just every station in the first pass. And then after that, of course, we got dupes. The other thing, look, note, on the left, attenuation 12 dB. So we're making the use of that window the best way possible. The other thing that just sort of was happenstance when I took this picture, look at the station on the left that says clicks. That guy's got terrible key clicks. You can not only see it on the spectrum, slow, sco spectrum scope, kind of like the spectrum analyzer, but also on the waterfall. Look how wide he is. And then we've got two other listed as clean, and one on the further far right, so almost the same strength. So you can't blame it. Well, he's weaker, he's stronger. That guy's nice and narrow. So we need to be a good neighbor. We're all sharing the band, and there's no reason for having terrible key clicks like this, and I'll discuss that in a moment in more detail, but um, look, how, look at the detail that's on these direct sampling displays. Now, with the uh, Yezu, it's not a direct sampling radio, but the display is. And of course, in the ICOM, it's all direct sampling. And in the Kenwood case, it's a direct sampling display. So the, the resolution is just astounding today. You can see the guys with the key clicks or the splatter on sideband. So 
the year of the hybrid was what, you know, announcements and eventually shipping, but the hybrid radio is like a K3, but then once we get to um, uh, the first IF, the display is direct sampling, and, and then we do go into digital after that. So in some cases, this is kind of the best of both worlds. We've got a roofing filter, which we just saw in the previous presentation. If we can narrow down what the digital stuff has to look at, instead of seeing a whole, the whole band or more, it makes the life a lot easier for the DSP and the, all the you know, FPGA and all that kind of stuff. Field day would probably be the, the worst case most of us deal with on a regular basis. We've got multiple, particularly if we've got multiple transmitters on the same band. Wouldn't be unusual to have CW and sideband and now FT8, of course, this last field day, all on the same band, and that's really tough. So you've got to really watch how your antennas are set up for good isolation and how we're running the receiver and what's, what's the best receiver for field day, maybe the hybrid or even just uh, like the K3, which we don't really call a hybrid. Is testing is, of course, what I started doing back in about 1976, and that will everything, of course, was pure analog then, and then the digital came along. And really, these hybrids with you really don't have to worry about testing them anything different than I've been doing for all these years. They they've got the the, the roofing filter, they've got the, the digital, so and they pretty much um, ha have a the, the type of overload characteristics that we're kind of used to. How many people are kind of waiting for the K4? Anybody got one on order? No? <laughs> well, the, the K4 architecture is going to be like the 70 ICOM 7610. It's a direct sampling radio, no roofing filters and all that. But if you buy the K4 HD, which we hope ships one of these days, that's going to have a down conversion roofing filters and all that. So that's the way the Yezu, the 101D, is going to have the same type of architecture as the K4 HD, and then just the standard K4 will be like the ICOM. So that's interesting that they're offering both. Most of the time, we probably don't care, but Field Day will be a good example of why the HD would have an advantage. The direct sampling radios, though, don't necessarily have the same distortion curve. We, we can make a measurement for dynamic range, and that's a one data point. But really, when we're looking at the direct sampling, it's really helpful to make a measurement input test level versus the distortion and make a graph, or at least mentally look at the data, because they're, they're just not the same. And this is just the way the ADCs work, that they're, they, uh, they've got each ADC kind of has its own little distortion curve, and so every radio is going to be slightly different. I see. I've got some graphs here. It's going to show uh, one case, uh, VHF, UHF radio, and, uh, and then we'll look at a K3 and a Flex, actually. And the fact that when we're going to publish numbers now for the newer style radios, it's not as clear cut. Now, of course, we really have to say, well, this is basic information, and we've got to use the radio on the air and find out how it really performs. And I'm, I think some people think that they'll say, well, the lab measurement is all we, all we need to know about, and that's crazy. We need to know human interface and how it all works, like in the real world, too. But anyway, uh, here's the distortion curve of the ICOM 9700 VHF UHF it's 2 meters 70 centimeters and 23 centimeters this is the 2 meter data and it, it, as Bob was mentioning you know, how many people have the 7300 if you've got the 7300 you're used to a button that says IP plus well IP plus is kind of a meaningless term because third order intercept has no no meaning with a direct sampling radio but that's what they called it and that's the overload point of the um, ADC. And um, in the case of the 7300 or the 7610, 
The chip has dither in it, as does the flex, as does the Apache chip, for instance. The flex does not. So how you're going to linearize your ADC is kind of up to the OEM, but most people have chosen a chip for HF anyway that's got this dither, which smooths out the variations from step to step on the uh, ADC. But this radio here for uh, ICOM on two meters and 70 centimeters is direct sampling, clear up there. And, but it does not have on-chip dither, but they've got the IP plus button. Well, what's it do? Doesn't do much. <laughs> you, you can see there's sort of two graphs there almost on top of each other. One's with the IP plus on and off. It's like nothing. So I don't know what ICOM's doing on the 9700. I love the radio. I retired my 25-year-old uh, monoband two-meter rig from ICOM. So but what is the diametric range of this radio? By definition, when that distortion product equals the noise floor, that difference is the diametric range. Well, when I measure, this has happened to be my radio, and everybody's is slightly different because everybody's chip is slightly different, and since it doesn't have dither, the variation is more significant. So I published 75 dB because that's, by definition, the worst case scenario. The league published 91, and I got 91 too at the other point. But look at it. We go, we start at 75, and then we increase the signals. The distortion goes up about 10 dB, and, but then it goes down again. And then it goes up again, and it goes down again. So I don't know. What is the dynamic range of this radio? Is it 75 dB? Is it 91? Or who knows? So that's kind of where we're stuck with uh, direct sampling, particularly without dither. Now, Flex does something different. Their chip, because they, when they started with the, uh, the 6700, um, they wanted to go up to two meters, and they didn't choose one with dither, so they've had to do something else. And what they actually, the something else, is inject a signal that you can't see on who knows what frequency at who knows what level to try to linearize things. So they're kind of in a different world from that standpoint. But it does linearize the chip. So now here's a case where we've got not funny curve. It kind of looks like a sine wave. And this was a comparison between the K3S and the Flex 6700 on 10 meters. And I wanted to make the test uh, as fair as possible, which is what I really always want to do. So we set the radios so the noise floor of the two radios was identical, minus 135 dBm. In the case of the K3S, that was with the preamp off. In the case of the 6700, that was with the 20 dB preamp on. Identical noise floor, and then I graphed the um, signal in versus the distortion. And you see they're virtually parallel. A little wobble down there on the low end for the flex on the left, but kind of insignificant. And in this case, since the, the, the display, this graph doesn't have that funny looking sine wave, well, I think the data is pretty useful. In the case of the flex, it was uh, 96 with the preamp on. It happened to be 99 with the preamp off because I did the same thing on 40 meters. And then the uh, K3S was 105. So in that case, I think a single, single number comes through okay. But of course, if you've got a, a less than ideal monotonic graph like these two are, then the one number, like what's it mean? Like in the other case, is it 75? Is it what? I don't know. So here's the worst graph I've ever made of a radio. And I don't know what the diamond range is. All we know is that S9 plus 8 dB, which isn't really strong, it had the worst distortion before it kind of, you know, totally crashed. So, and this had to be measured in 1 dB increments. Otherwise, if you just said, okay, I'll make it, measure it in 5 dB steps, all those funny wobbles in there would be smoothed out. So you wouldn't know what the numbers were. So it's kind of a case where uh, we, we really have to be careful when we're making our laboratory measurements to see what are we really getting here. This is something was just touched on their previous case in field day, a guy a mile away, uh, multi multi contest. Well, the direct sampling radios have no roofing filters. They're going to have either a bandpass filter. In the case of like the new Flex 6600, it's got bandpass filters unless you go into general coverage mode. 
but most of the time we have what's called a half octave filter and that's pretty broad so like on 20 meters the 7610 front end is going to cover 11 megahertz to 15 megahertz and there's a lot of commercial stuff in there now the 7610 happens to have a tracking pre-selector so that helps the 7300 does not it's a thousand dollar radio i mean what do you want for a thousand bucks it's just amazing so in that case uh, if we're on the low end of 40 meter cw and all those broadcast stations are up at above 7200 the tracking pre-selector will help by about 10 db but let's say we're on 7196 and the broadcast stations on 7205 guess what the tracking tracking pre-selector isn't going to do much almost zero So attenuation, which was just mentioned here a half an hour ago, this is your friend. Um, depending on the band noise, and of course we know the lower bands are really noisy in comparison to 10 or 15 meters. So we really want to optimize that window of dynamic range and move it around so we're really running the transceiver the right way. On, on most radios, now I'm not going to, the Flex and the Apache are going to be different, and I explain that, but most of the time if band noise is reading upscale in your S meter, there's no advantage to that. And also, the other problem is, say we're working a contest, we're going to be on the air for 10 hours or more, and every time there's no signal, the AGC brings the band noise up as loud as the signal we want to work, and this makes me tired anyway, so I call it contest fatigue of course it doesn't have to be in a contest but if you're if the band noise is always filling in every space depending on of course the agc decay you've chosen uh, it's just uh, tiring so i like to turn on attenuation on the lower bands on the, the, the most all the every radio except the the flex and the apache which adjust the agc threshold with a separate control but we don't have that adjustment on unlike the icom or the or the kenwood uh, or the Yezu. So the attenuation, if we adjust the attenuation so the S meter is like barely moving or maybe less than that, the band noise isn't going to fill in all the holes. And that really helps me make it through a contest for, you know, 12 hours or something like that. So on 40 meters, for instance, assuming we're using our transmit antenna, not a beverage or something like that, I'm going to run 6 to 12 dB attenuation. On 160 at night, I'm typically running 18 dB attenuation. We lose nothing because the receiver noise floor is like minus 135 and band noise at night on 160 is like minus 90 or something like that. So we don't have a sensitivity problem on the lower bands and that's why we can run attenuation and the receiver is just loafing along. <clears throat> so what's really desirable today? Well, if you're a CW operator, I kind of like QSK or at least semi-break-in. That's the way I do. I, I don't need to hear between every dip, but I sure like to hear between every station gets a 599 report. I'm not sure why that is. <laughs> <laughs> and then I send my, my location, Colorado. So I want to hear between 599's face here in Colorado. So that I happen to run semi-break-in. Audio peak filter, this really helps. Like the same reason that we don't want to hear band noise filling in all the spaces, the audio peak filter takes out some of the noise. It, and maybe your receiver's got a little bit of hiss or something like that. Anyway, we don't need to hear that, all that stuff. So I don't run my audio peak filter at like a 50 hertz bandwidth, but, but I make it maybe a little narrower than my DSP bandwidth. Most of them are adjustable today. And uh, so that helps. I can't imagine buying a radio today without a band scope. Now, of course, in the past, we maybe it was an accessory like the P3, or maybe we had to a dongle SDR that's providing it for a TS590S or something like that. But the band scope is not, I mean, when they came out, the ICOM 781 was the first radio with the band scope, and I thought, well, that's fish finder. That's silly. Who needs it? <laughs> <laughs> it when it came out, it was $6,500, and for some reason, I couldn't afford it. <laughs> I later bought one used for a whole lot less than that. And then I started contesting more, and I thought, wow, this helps. And even in a de-expedition, I can see where all those zillion guys are calling the DX, and maybe there's a hole there. So 
I think the band scope and the waterfall, and then initially we didn't have waterfalls, and now we got waterfalls, and I didn't know what to do with the waterfall, and I went to Contest University, which is the day before Dayton. If you really would like to get a lot of information, Contest University is not just about contesting. They certainly cover that. Tower safety, FT8, how to use a waterfall well. So consider it. You get breakfast, lunch, and great teachers for 100 bucks, or more or less, whatever it costs today. Anyway, enough for Contest University, great place to go. Um, so I want to have the uh, band scope. I want to have an uh, efficient user interface. For me, I'm a kind of a knob guy. I got my license in 1961. We didn't have much SDR back then. And so I'm kind of used to knobs, but whatever you like. But I, most people, though, with a radio that runs with a computer, at least they want a tuning knob. So we need some sort of a user interface. We certainly wanted it to have a rock solid connection to our logging program. How did we do it in the old days? My first contesting was on 160 and why I was in high school. And we had a great big piece of paper on the wall. And when you worked a station, you tried to put it where you thought it was going to be alphabetic order for the next 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> what was our CQing machine back then? A reel to reel tape recorder like Bob Heil has in his home. And we had a loop in it that had, had audio tones on it that drove a relay. So the relay went CQ, CQ, D, E, K, R, R, H with some mechanical monstrosity like that. Boy, we don't have to do that today. The, um, like for the instance, the Apache, there's something called the DJ console. It has knobs and buttons. And it's a really nice way to make the interface kind of like for us old guys that like knobs. So now we're going to talk about the numbers that come out of the laboratory. And how do we optimize a radio? Like maybe until like two years ago, I didn't own a radio that had a dynamic range over 78. And I enjoyed the contesting with it. So we don't have to have absolute state of the art. There's a lot of radios that work really well. So here's just sort of a graphic of what is the dynamic range test? We feed in the two signals, and we know what a third order product is. It isn't a guess. It's all math. And so if we have a spacing of, let's just say, 10 kilohertz of between the signal one and signal two, the distortion product is exactly that same spacing above the high frequency signal and exactly the same spacing below the low frequency signal. And But we do want to be sure we're listening to the third order product. I got burned once testing a Drake R7 at 100 kilohertz because it had such a terrible synthesizer, I couldn't do it at 20 kilohertz. I did it at 100 and I was getting a number that made no sense. And then I said, well, let's wobble the signal generators and see if I'm really listening to the third order product. And guess what? It was some sort of a birdie. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to be careful. Bob Allison has put out, at, he's the one that does the league laboratory tests now for the product reviews. So he's got a couple of sidebars, 2012, 2016, discussing reciprocal mixing, diamond range in more detail, but it's the phase noise performance of the radio, which really until relatively recently, almost all synthesized radios were phase noise limited, reciprocal mixing, diamond range. Not true today, we're more radios than we had a few years ago. We say, okay, what's this really mean? Well, in one case, like if you were on field day and you were on sideband and the CW op was down on 70 to 20 or something, and if you just listen and you heard and you're up the band 150 kilohertz, that was, in this case, transmitted phase noise plus probably receiver phase noise. And so you had that noise keying that you would hear going on and off. A little harder to understand on sideband, of course, although it could follow the, you know, your speech. So this is a little graphic I found in the web, and this little bullet nose signal on the left is what we're trying to copy, and he's weak. And let's just say a couple kilohertz up the band, we've got a really strong signal that's perfect. Now there is no such thing as a perfect signal, but let's just pretend it was perfect. And then we've got our local oscillator for the non-direct sampling radios. We're talking about super hit, like the SX-28, and 
it has noise on the oscillator. Now, back when we had like the Drakes and the Collins, we had a crystal controlled for each band and a PTO or a, a, a capacitor tune uh, local oscillator. But it had a little bit of noise and nothing significant. But when the synthesized radios came out, guess what? That was significant. So we've got noise on the LO, and what it does, it mixes the noise on the LO to that strong signal that's two KCs away from the weak signal and puts noise modulated sidebands on the strong signal. So there over on the right, that great big blue thing is the, has the noise sidebands superimposed on the signal that was perfect, but it isn't perfect anymore because of the LO. So that's why it can cover up what we're trying to copy when it's uh, in this case nearby, but then if we really were a sort of mediocre radio today and we're on 100 KCs up the band, we may still be hearing those noise sidebands. Except for a few legacy Superhet radios, uh, uh, we really didn't have many that were not phase noise limited. We really would like the phase noise performance to be better than the third order dynamic range performance because it only takes one signal with the phase noise issue to cause a problem uh, if the radio is, whether it's uh, the receive side or not. And the dynamic range is an intermodulation where we'll have two or more signals. And of course, in a contest, we got piles of signals. So we really want that number to be larger than dynamic range. Now we're amazingly good shape. The, the new Kenwood, the new Yezu, the K3S. If you have a K3, go buy the synthesizer upgrade. It's like a hundred and a quarter or whatever it costs. Hopefully they'll keep offering that because they're not selling K3s anymore, but hopefully they still sell that module. As that really makes a difference. Well, now and then we had the Hilberling, kind of expensive, $18,000. <laughs> the ICOM 7851, it's cheap, $12,000. <laughs> but anyway, those had, those were, uh, those have this amazing synthesizer, uh, very low. But now the direct sampling is hard to screw up a direct sampling radio. All you have to do is have a clean clock, the clock that or whatever frequency it's on. If it's a clean clock, we don't have a phase noise problem. So look, the 7300, the 7610, all the flex stuff that's uh, new or old, you know, all the 6000 series and the Apache Anon series. So with the with the new stuff, we don't have to really worry about you'd really have to blow it to have a synthesizer have the clock in your uh, direct sampling radio be terrible. Luckily, we can live with the non-perfect radio if perfect is now the Yezu 110. We really can do well with 85, certainly 90. The TR7 came out in about 97, and maybe it was the second uh, upconversion radio. But between about 2000, um, up to 2003, so from the uh, late 70s to 2003, uh, all we had was really upconversion radios or boat anchors. The Orion one came along and they went back to down conversion, meaning a low IF, you know, five, nine megahertz, 10 megahertz, whatever it was. And those radios in that time period, we bought them. They worked, sort of. They weren't great on uh, a CW pilot, but dynamic range was in the 70s. Maybe it got up to 75, maybe it was 65, but they were numbers that are kind of modest by today's standards. On sideband, you kind of got away with it, and I'll explain why. But in CW, that was the uh, worst case, and uh, the receivers just didn't perform. I mean, we're just spoiled now. Most of the time, our radios aren't stressed, if it, if it were. I mean, if the if the radio is going to fall apart in a DX pileup, but we're not in the DX pileup the other 300 days of the year. So that's why we really were able to cope with the radios that were less than ideal. This is the off my website. And I want to clarify, this is the top 18 radios, not individual models. If you look at my website, there are actually duplicates, like there's two or three or four K3s because they came out in 2008 and then the K3S came out. There's also that information from the 10 meter test. The direct sampling radios, every one is slightly different because each chip is slightly different. So I've got a couple of 7610s, a couple of 7300s, and so 
this is the list of the individual, top individual 18 transceiver models. We go all the way from 110 to 90 dB, which is really adequate most of the time. Like the Eagle, the Kenwood 590S. I mean, the 590S and the SG <coughs> used to be the biggest bang for the buck. It's like $1,500, and it was great. Now we got a 7300 for sometimes on sale under 1000 My goodness. But all these will work just fine. Of this list, I've used 12 of these of the 18 in contest CQ Worldwide, uh, ARRL contest. Uh, so it, it really had a, it's been great since I've been out in the country in my contest station for the last 12 or 12 years to really just use this stuff and see how it works. As for, you know, what's the user interface like and all that kind of thing. So you got a lot of choices today, and the used market has been crashed. Since the 7300 came out, the price for used stuff is cratered. If you're buying it, that's great. If you're trying to sell it, not so great. <clears throat> so why do we need a higher dynamic range on CW? I mentioned that you know we kind of got away with it with the 70 dB radios on sideband, not so much on CW. A CW signal that's not full of key clicks is about a KC wide at minus 60 dB. <coughs> a sideband signal is about 10 KCs wide at minus 60 dB, which may be kind of a surprise, but um, so the, the sidebands may be the limit. So here's something that appeared in uh, my QST article. It came out in November. Did anybody read that article on uh, time to clean up our transmitters? So this is one of the pictures from that article, and this happens to be a TS-890S. And you can go into most radios today on CW and adjust the rise time. And they let you pick rise time as fast as one millisecond. It should be labeled, instead of one millisecond, terrible key clicks. <laughs> <laughs> or you can slow it way down to six. And I really like six. Now, there's the difference. 25 dB difference in the key clicks at one kilohertz between one millisecond and six. We would need to be a good neighbor, and when we're running 25 dB of terrible key clicks, we're not a good neighbor. Here's something you may not have seen much. It's a way to look at sideband distortion products using white noise to approximate speech, or band-limited white noise, because we're not passing you know, 20 KC audio. And this was provided by W6XX. And it compares the K3 to um, a, a Mark V in Class A, which, by the way, is very similar to Apache Pure Signal, can be even better than Class A. So if we look at it, the K3, we're not knocking the K3. It's not, it's kind of typical, maybe a little worse than typical, but we have to get six KCs away from the edge of the transmitted signal to get the the intermod products down 60 dB. But with the Mark V in Class A, one and a half kilohertz, and we're down 60 dB. Or with pure signal, it'd be the same thing. The, the, di the difference between 60 dB would be trying to work a station S3, while a guy, say, a few KCs away is S9 plus 30. Well, that's not unheard of. S3, we should be able to copy that, but if the guy's calling CQ contest, CQ contest, CQ contest, and he's three KCs away, we're going to have a hell of a hard time copying the S3 signal. So to show you that this using band-limited white noise is really the same as the two-tone test, there I just superimposed the two. Now, of course, the spacing of our test tones affects how that two-tone test works, but this is a valid test, and it's really a more approximate speech. And when we're calling CQ, are those high frequency noises what really spreads out our distortion products? Here's an example of a pure signal. The station, actually, it's KA0KA. It lives in Loveland, Colorado. I was talking to him, and now he is a hi fi SSB guy. I don't happen to get into that. He was running 4.6 kilohertz bandwidth, but that was his choice, not my choice. So the one on the right, this says pure signal, 
look how straight up and down the sides of his signal are. So if he'd squeezed it down to 2.7, which is what I'd choose, he's got no splatter side bends you can even see. But just happened while I was talking to uh, Tyler, look at the guy down the band 14 kilohertz. <laughs> that's just awful. Now that's probably overdriving is linear, maybe my guess. I don't think any rig's that bad unless <laughs> we had knobs to the right, like processing max, volume control, uh, mic gain max, I don't know. So the other thing is to look at if these guys not so terrible. Look at what your band scope and your waterfall are showing on the opposite sideband. If there's a lot of crud on the opposite sideband, then that's, that's no, no. <laughs> but you, what you're looking though when you're transmitting, let's say I'm looking at my 7610 or my 890S, we're not seeing what's coming out of the transmitter PA. We're just seeing that what's being generated as a DSP level. It looks like we're perfect. Guess what? We're not. I'll use my Perseus as a look at my transmitter and see what really is going on. So what's the limit today? Well, the receivers have improved an astounding amount. It, like 11 years ago, well, the K3 came out in 2008. The transmitters really have not improved, and except for Apache Pure Signal, they've gotten worse. And that's kind of sad. Often, the bandwidth of what we're transmitting, whether it's splatter on sideband, key clicks on CW, or broadband noise, which I'll touch on in a moment, all these things just add to the cred on the band, and we'd really like to see the transmitters get better. So in, in the QST article, I talked about all those three types of noise, splatter noise, key click noise, or broadband noise. The article started out, the, Bob Allison said, write up an article for QEX on broad, transmitted broadband noise. And I thought, well, there's more to noise than that. So I wrote the article up, and to my amazement, they said, we're not going to put it in QEX, we're going to put it in QST. And I was surprised because this was good. In effect, even though I didn't name brands except for the Collins 32S3, which I said was the cleanest transmitter I've ever owned, I made references to reviews in QST if one bothered to look up the model numbers. And so QST lives on advertising, but they were willing to say our transmitters should be better and three cheers for them. Also in this same November issue, I was amazed. They've reviewed the, uh, the new um, SPE amplifier and they showed what the distortion products were with standard, but they were driving it with an Apache 7000 DLE, and they used pure signal, which is pre-distortion, used in the broadcast industry, used in cell phone transmitters. It went from minus 28 PEP, which not too exciting, to minus 47, 19 dB better, 19 dB less splatter with uh, pure signal. And so far, the only software that does that is the Apache software, but look, all the new amplifiers are providing a sampled output. Now you can provide an external sampler to feed back in your Apache, but you know, the SPE, the, the, uh, the Elecraft amp, the Flex amp, they all, and the, uh, maybe even the uh, Palstar amp, they all have this output already built in. So we're kind of saying, wonder what's down the road. Maybe more and more rigs will start offering it. So, so there, I, that's already sort of covered. We've got the, you know, the three kinds of noise. If you can go into your menu and set your rise time on CW, set it for six, and uh, just ignore the one that doesn't say terrible key clicks. Transmitted broadband noise hasn't gotten much press. Um, I think occasional ICOM ad will mention the term, but it just hasn't been talked about much. There's the K3S or in the K3 with the, old, with the replacement synthesizer. Look how good it is at not only 10 kilohertz, but 100 kilohertz. So it's kind of the top dog there. If we look at the um, just 7610, for example, well, it's not as good at 10, but it's virtually identical at 100. But what we really want, don't want is it to be not improved with spacing. Because if we are on field day and the guy's on 7020 and we're up on... Uh, you know, 
2.30 or something, we'd really like that noise, transmitted noise, to uh, be better at the wide spacing, but then some of the rigs aren't. And particularly, it's affected by the power. They're usually much better at 100 watts, if it's a 100 watt rig, than they are at 30 watts. Why do we consider about 30 watts? Well, a lot of the amplifiers today, particularly solid state, or in an 8877, it only may take 35 watts of drive. If the, if the composite broadband noise is worse than 30 watts, this is a big deal, because we're amplifying the noise too. The league has a fancy Roden Schwartz phase noise measuring equipment donated by Ulrich Roda of Roden Schwartz, and it only measures phase noise. But that's not the whole picture. Sometimes the AM noise is significant, other times it's not too significant. So I started complaining to Bob Allison and say, look, in some cases what you're publishing as transmitted noise is not the picture. And so he's working on this to just come up with another way to do it. I measure transmitted noise with the Perseus. And there, that's been no limit at all. On the, I can't maybe measure this really super signal generator as far as its dynamic range limit. But with the transmitters today, no problem measuring with the Perseus. And you could probably use other direct sampling radios. So the following information is going to be about the 7300 at 30 watts. And hopefully the league will now get this solved. And the new rotor in Schwartz, though, measures both. And it's only $145,000. If someone would like to donate one to the league, they might accept it. So here's a, 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 the output of the Roden Schwartz that does measure AM noise separately from uh, phase noise or the composite noise. And really, composite noise is what we really want to know about. If we make a measurement with the Perseus, it's only measuring composite noise, in other words, the total noise. So if we look at the graph there, one of them, you know, goes way down here, and that's the phase noise. And so that is falling off as we'd like. If um, if compo if phase noise equaled AM noise, the composite noise should be 3 dB higher. It is. Here at about 150 hertz offset, the phase noise and the AM noise are equal, and the composite noise is, goes up 3 dB. So that's exactly what it should do. But look at the composite noise, or really just the, in this case, the AM noise is like 20 dB worse. But what was published was only this number. Mm -hmm. So we'll hope over time that the league can get that solved because their fantastic equipment is, doesn't measure the whole story. The state of the art of linear amplifiers are not so linear. <laughs> In 1997, the league published a compendium of a half a dozen amps. They were tube amps, of course. And everyone was had third order products down 40 to 50 dB. Pretty darn good. Better than the rigs. The review this spring, or being like almost a year ago now, for the KPA 1500, minus 30 versus minus 40 to 50. And then the uh, Power Genius from Flex, it's better on 40, it's virtually identical to Elecraft on 20. And on 10 and 6, it's even minus 27. So not exciting. Now, of course, if we had pre-distortion in the loop, you can clean up the amplifier. And um, it would be nice to say that things have improved. But there, if the tube amp is 10 or 20 dB cleaner, the solid state amps are not. And the solid state amps are noisier. They've got, acoustically, they've got fans that are blowing a heck of a lot of air because you can't run a, a, a LDMOS chip at the temperature you can run a tube. So heating and noise is a big, big, big issue too. At least it is for me. I can't stand the noise. So what's the bottom line on how we want to operate? Um, we want to use that dynamic range window, move it around, use the attenuation where appropriate, use the preamp if you need it, and uh, keep the fatigue under control. Like I say, with the, uh, I like to set my AGC threshold 6 to 10 dB above band noise. 
and that really helps. Occasionally, I'm working a really weak station, and I got to turn the volume up. But the other 95% of the time, it really helps me uh, live with the uh, the noise. The Flex and the Apache don't work the same way as I mentioned. They've got a AGC threshold adjustment. So it's AGCT for the Flex. It's a, a line in the screen for the uh, Apache. You slide it up so it just you don't do it with attenuation. It just do it in a different way, but accomplishes the same thing. I can't imagine using a preamp on 40 meters at night. I was talking to a friend of mine uh, just chit chit chat during the day, and I said, uh, what's your noise level reading? He says, well, it's reading like S9. I said, well, what, is the preamp on? Yeah. Turn it off, it's reading S7. But I said, well, why are we running the preamp 40 meters? I don't know why. But it's, I've had people come up to me after Contest University. I've spoken there for 12 years in a row. And they said, I had no idea that I shouldn't just, if in doubt, run the preamp. It's, maybe it's counterintuitive, but uh, not the way to do it. Here's a little more information on the fact that why we don't want to run the preamp with a direct sampling radio that has no roofing filter. Look at the bandpass filters for the 7610, just as an example, on 40 meters. It's covering 6 to 8 megahertz. Think of all the broadcast stations and commercial stations in there. 20 meters, 11 to 15 megahertz. And on 15, uh, 15 meters, 15 megahertz to 22, and there's broadcast stations in there too. So that Digital stuff has got to deal with all that. The, the tracking pre-selector in the, it will help. 7300 doesn't have one, and so we just this is the reason that um, we have to manage our gain with the direct sampling radios more carefully. We can be lazy with the K3, turn on the preamp, ignore it because that roofing filter saves our butt, but um, not not so with the newer radios. Don't be a slave to one number, even my one number. It, that's on my website, that's sorted by close-in diameter range. That's a CW thing more than sideband because of the splatter issue and the fact that the splatter is worse than the uh, receiver's diameter range. So, but it's a starting point. Like we don't really want to buy a dud radio. So maybe we've got 18 that we can pick from, new or used. Um, Pick what's important to you. What are you operating? Um, I mean, I want good ergonomics. I need to be able to use the radio without hunting and pecking for making an adjustment. Um, factory service is important to me. Uh, I really want clean audio on receive and on transmit. I don't like the harsh audio. When the K3 came out, it had the worst audio I'd ever heard. And I kept complaining to Wayne about it, and I called him up. I was speaking at YCCC in Boxborough, and he said, Wayne, I'm going to talk at Boxborough about how terrible your K3 audio is, and he was going to give a presentation too. And and so that started, that was on Monday before the ham fest. He called me back on Wednesday and said, we've got it fixed. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot better. It's still over the next 10 years, it's improved. But I tell you, the, I've got spectrum analyzer plots in another presentation that showed and he even sent me before and after before was Wayne's spectrum analyzer plots terrible after they fixed it better so he had to admit this was the case so I, I just hate distortion and receive side and we don't want distortion on the transmit side the noise blanking and noise reduction this is a big deal I mean I happen to be out in the country I don't have much of it but how many people live in the country with their closest neighbor a mile away like one <laughs> so we have to deal with noise from all these uh, electronic things that we can't give up today so this is an important part is software I mean I want to use the term software defined radio differently than probably most do what what doesn't today have software in it if you had an ICOM 7700 it had a major update update in features with the waterfall and all that by just flashing the the firmware so you know this uh, the icon the kenwood the asia they're full of software you can't sell a radio now that doesn't have software in it now admittedly some it's totally in the computer and others it's all in firmware but anyway software is everywhere you can't 
I mean, even Flex said software is the radio, but everybody's software is the radio today. What's the, what's the long-term cost of ownership? I mean, sometimes you buy a $10,000 radio and you need a board and it's $900. Like the 7800, the, the oven oscillator would burn up 100% of the time. You could buy a new board for a mere 800 bucks. We, we got to look at that. So sensitivity is no problem today. Matter of fact, sensitivity was no problem with the 75A4. I got to see one at Bob Hiles, Hi Bob Hiles House last night, 75A4. It's a radio I've never used, but that had was actually reviewed in QST about 15 years ago as a vintage radio. Sensitivity was not a problem then. It's not a problem now. Drift, oh, no drift anymore. We don't have slugs going up and down that get out of alignment. We don't have to worry about that. Unless you're in a difficult RF environment, field day, a ham a mile away, two miles away, or multi multi contesting, we don't stress our radios to the max, so we're pretty lucky there. Okay, this is, may sound like heresy because I, you know, had this receiver test site now since uh, the late 70s. Um, what do I consider most important? Location antennas, operator skill if you're working DX or pileups or whatever, and the radio. But uh, someone will call me up and say, I want to work more DX, okay? What, what's your antenna? A 14 AVQ. <laughs> it's a 14 foot high and, and tall vertical and it's on the ground and he's got four radials. So we really need to look at the big picture. Now maybe we can't move and maybe I have an HOA. So we have to deal with what reality is. But there's, there's a lot, I mean, antenna, 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 kind of like location, location, location. But don't buy a dud radio. I mean, the FT2000 was kind of a dud radio. The dynamic range was about under 60 dB. We don't need to do that. Well, I followed my advice, and I moved to the country. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm a fanatic, and every antenna is a monoband yagi. So, um, so I went off the deep end, and my wife said, this was about 12 and a half years ago, and she said, you've always wanted to get a better place, so let's do it. The housing crisis has kind of brought the price of housing down, and um, so that's what I did. And uh, I don't have any trees, but I made my own trees. Uh, there's a lot of information I mentioned at Contest University from past episodes, just like you can get videos of like last year at Slidell. Um, you go to that link, and if anybody wants a uh, you know, PDF copy of this, just send me an email, rob at nc0b.com, rob at nc0b.com, and you know, things like that are available. Rick, DJ0IP, he publishes a lot of things that I p put out, including sort of stream of consciousness comments on using different radios and contests, and he's got those on his website. So there's a link to his website. Or if you just do a Google search, um, Sherwood Shootouts, and boom, it comes up. So uh, you might find some of that interesting. So there you have it, lots of information available. Who's up next? Questions. What's that? Oh, questions. Okay, well, we didn't have any questions there. Yes, question. Uh, at the beginning of your uh, presentation, Rob, you were talking about the effects of uh, phase noise versus bandwidth and so forth. And of course, CW is typically the most expensive radio in the market. Newer digital modes like FT8 and JT65 are effectively very much narrower bandwidth. Is that going to have any effect on measurements of performance? Right, or yeah, so I think J, JT9, which I use on uh, 630 meters, his bandwidth is just a few hertz. Yeah. But anytime where either the receiver has phase noise issues or the transmitter that's nearby has it, it's still noise. And so if it raises the noise floor, that's bad. Um, I mean, 
I can't, I worked Australia on 630 meters on JT9. I couldn't even hear the signal. So so the uh, the fact that narrow bandwidth, but it doesn't, just it, it lets us copy that signal in the noise, but at the same time, if if we add a noise to it, it's not desirable. And in, in FT8, we're looking at a two and a half to three KC bandwidth. So in that case, it's, it's having to pick out, it, you know, it is making measurements in a few hertz bandwidth, but it's still, that signal report is a uh, reference to the noise in the whole bandwidth, so yeah, it's there. <laughs> well, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't write the software. So, by the way, that just have, just a second. Um, W3LPL. I don't know if you know him, but he's a big contester, and he also has a lot to do with field day at at, uh, at um, one of the clubs in there in the east. And he lines up all the antennas, by the way, in a line so that they get most isolation. He wanted me to make a dynamic range measurement on uh, WSJT. I said, well, I don't know how to do that to the software, but like, we don't really care what the software can do. What's the system do? So I made measurements on 630 meters using Whisper because between noon and 2 o'clock on a, in, a, in the, uh, I think it was January, I had signals doing Whisper transmissions that were 500 or more miles away that didn't vary a dB over two hours. So uh, the WSJT's dynamic range is somewhere between 75 and 80 dB, which is just astounding. So we, and I never turn the AGC off. By the way, I run the AGC on on fast, and I run my little signal uh, receive level about 68, and that really gave me this 75 to 80 b dynamic range. Uh, to say. The AGC at six went. I'm not, I run I run AGC on in my case fast, so I'm not I don't know what you mean by six. The, the number six dB. Oh, oh uh, well, I I prefer to set the band again the band noise. I would be run to just barely touch in the S meter. So for instance, on 630 meters, it reads S two. So. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm totally understanding your question, but. I'm probably not asking it right, which is normal for me. Or they call me no nothing very But anyway, uh, you were talking about the AGC earlier. Yes. And you said you ran it at about 6 dB. Oh, okay. 6 dB uh, above band noise. Right. Yes. So Yes, I mean, like I would, in that case, I really want the AGC to, AGC to be operating, so I probably would set the attenuation or the RF gain so the S meter on band noise was just barely moving. In that case, with the JT, I don't have to worry about the contest fatigue issue, so I would want the AGC to be uh, just barely running on noise. And then, then at two and a half KC bandwidth or whatever you've set your rig at. Yes. I haven't seen much variation in the the uh, legacy super heads. Now, of course, we could have a defective one, and I've had a couple defective. The FTDX 9000 was defective, and I didn't ever publish anything on that. But there would be in a case where it would be handy for a ham club to have a signal generator. I mean, if you make a basic noise floor measurement and uh, a sensitivity measurement, you should probably be able to find the, the defective radio, but I've measured, well, look on their websites, like four or five K3s and K3S and variation over time, and 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 I've 
two, I majored two uh, uh, K, KX3s, and they were like within one dB of each other. So I haven't seen much sample-to-sample -sample variation on the legacy radios. But the, the sample-to-sample -sample variation, not sensitivity, not noise floor on the direct sampling with the, with the uh, dither off is significant. And with the dither on, it's less significant. But if you look, there's two ICR8600 receivers. It's a DC to light. And that ADC just ha with the dither on just happened to be near the top of the chart where the other one, that was the one I have known, I lucked out. And the other one I measured was down at like 10 dB less. So, but I don't think if you had a had a, a super hit short of just having one that just seemed to be defective, not that much difference. Okay, thank you. Yes. So, so you said the 9700, and you know the, the frequency drift problem. Yeah. So, so that seems to be an issue with uh, internal frequency range and real bottom and the bottom for that, that sort of thing. Right. No, that's just a drift issue, and it, see, it's, this is weird. ICOM has five radios out for HF that have ability to phase lock the, the local oscillator to a standard like a GPS DO or a crystal oven oscillator or I happen to have rubidium. And at HF, we don't really need that. But on the VHF radio, guess what? They blew it. <laughs> so they've got a clock in there that's relatively clean. But the fan comes on as the uh, you're transmitting, and it drifts. <laughs> so they improved it by continuously updating. You can feed in at 10 megahertz. It doesn't phase lock, but it like every two seconds it says, "Oh, I need to correct the frequency." But it's not the solution. So there's a, a solution out of the Europe, yeah. and then there's VK1XX is, was going to ship it. I haven't seen it yet. And it actually does it a different way, but it, it is, is, is the either one of those would be the total solution. Yeah. yeah. So that you I mean, how did Icon blow that? I have no idea. Does your signal sample the fan noise and the, the, the fan and, and by which you <laughs> that one? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Now, w speaking of open source, I mean, all the Apache stuff is open source. And all the DSP stuff and pure signals written by NR0V, uh, Warren Pratt, who lives in Loveland, Colorado now. So this is really convenient. And he has something in the noise reduction standpoint called um, uh, spectral noise blanker. And uh, if you've operated a contest with a noise blanker on, this is usually a disaster. <laughs> so. What he does with spectral noise blanker is he only looks at the bandwidth of the filter. So you're on CW with a 200 hertz filter. He somehow is able to uh, do noise reduction in that bandwidth. And, it, and the signal of KCOA doesn't have any effect. He gave a presentation for Tapper about three years ago at, at Dayton. And they had this extremely noisy environment. And a person was running a net. And you could hardly copy anything. And then they turned on his spectral noise blanker, and you thought it was FM. I mean, the, the people, there are some really smart people out there. And that's the advantage of open source is you've got these brilliant people that in some niche thing they know about, and they can add something to the software, and suddenly you've got this tremendous capability. So it's, it's uh, hard to compete with open source. Anything else? All right, very good. Oh, yes, what? Yeah. Well, they they they've been Gerald's been talking about pre distortion ever since Flex came out with the uh, five thousand anyway, and they supposedly are working on it, but it hasn't. You know, in their list of people's complaints and bugs and all that, it hasn't gone up very far. I would hope Flex would offer at some point. Uh, and the real question will be, will the standalone radios like ICOM, Kenwood, and Yezu, will they ever be able to offer that type of number crunching? It takes a lot of number crunching to do pre-distortion. So I don't know if, if Mr. Inouye is ever going to be able to do it. But uh, tell me that the front has very little already. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than the K3 by about 6 dB, but it's still about 
minus 30 PEP. I like a lot of radios. Now that 30, the 50 volt PA radios are better, the TS990S is about five or six dB better than the typical 13.8 volt radio. So, but no, unfortunately the average solid state radio today is 10 or 20 dB worse than a 32S3. <laughs> I guess that means boat anchors still have a place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tubes forever. <laughs> <laughs>